I'm Michael Small. I'm the Executive Director of Carbon Talks in Renewable Cities here at SFU's Center for Dialogue. It's a real pleasure to have everyone here and those of you who either are or will be shortly watching online uh, for our Carbon Talk today on the title of Climate Action in BC, Where Do We Go From Here? A title we felt was sufficiently open-ended to take into account all past and future foreseeable events. So um, this topic, which we picked about a month ago, was timely because of the release of the province's climate leadership plan. It's become even more timely with events of the last week. And we've got two great analysts to kind of help unpack what's going on in the province and what could be going on in the future in the area of climate action and, and uh, CO2 emissions and other related topics, energy and otherwise. Uh, our guests, both from SFU, I might add, uh, Jeremy uh, Morehouse, uh, Senior Policy Analyst with Clean Energy Canada, which is a program that's also part of the Centre for Dialogue, and Nancy Olweiler, who probably needs little introduction, Professor of Public Policy here at SFU and one of Canada's best known natural resource economists. Um, a couple of brief comments. I've mentioned it will be webcast. We'd very much like to thank our sponsors, the North Growth Foundation, who sponsors all of Carbon Talks activity, and Pacific Institutes for Climate Solutions, which helps fund our ability to live cast and to podcast these uh, events. Uh, this is a, meant to be a dialogue, so for those of you for whom it's the first time, our two speakers together will speak for 20 minutes, then I'll turn the floor over to questions and comments both from people in the room and by Twitter from those people who are watching remotely. Our hashtag, uh, send questions by Twitter to at Carbon Talks. Our hashtag is simply Carbon Talks. Um, uh, we very much do welcome comments. Uh, this is not an event where you're restricted to questions. Uh, by all means, comment. Feel free to comment on things you've heard other people say as well as our presenters at the front but we will want to keep comments short. I suspect there'll be quite a lot of comments as well as questions uh, evinced by this topic. So uh, I think that covers everything that I need to do. Um, and I'll, I'll start by asking Jeremy to lead off. Thank you. Thank you for coming in today. I'll stand up because I've been sitting all day. Um, first a bit, just Clean Energy Canada. We're an NGO based out of here, Simon Fraser University, and we're working to accelerate a transition to renewable energy across Canada. We do that a lot of different ways. Sometimes it's doing unique research. I'll talk a little bit about this report we did. Uh, sometimes it's doing talks like this. Sometimes it's bringing stories from around the world to Canada that aren't, that aren't showing up in, in our media. Now, who, who are you people? Who, um, who liked the BC Climate Plan when it was announced back in August? Who read it? <laughs> yeah, that's a better question. All right, who was happy with the LNG announcement, the federal LNG announcement? Uh, just recently put your hand up. Okay, we've got a few people. And the carbon pricing announcement just from yesterday, federal, federal carbon price. Okay. So I'm gonna talk about a few of these things. I'm gonna start with the BC Climate Plan. Now for anyone who saw our uh, press release on this, it said BC Climate Plan fizzles. So there's not a lot of subtlety there. We weren't a big fan of that plan, but I'll go through some of the reasons why. Um, that's actually not a very positive conversation and at Clean Energy Canada we pride ourselves on being relentlessly positive and optimistic so I'm going to then bring it back to why I think you know well, we didn't agree with that plan there's still a lot of, uh, of reasons that we should see um, stronger policy coming in British Columbia so some of the positive things we can look forward to um, and then I'm going to end with uh, what's next so what are the, the opportunities coming up for new policies in British Columbia on renewable energy on climate policy, on electric vehicles, those kinds of things. So I'll start with the climate plan. It's right up front. This is our graphic. We took it out of the plan and, and modified it. Now, when this plan came out, if anyone's worked on you know, government policy, when something comes out on a Friday afternoon in the middle of the summer, your heart drops a little bit. So you're like, this is not going to be good news, right? If it's good news, it comes out on Monday morning or Tuesday morning, so everyone can see it. This came out on Friday afternoon, August 19th. I was actually on vacation, uh, sitting on by the water on a beautiful sunny day, and I had to go hide myself in a little cabin in the dark to, uh, to work on this. Um, and the number one thing that I do for a climate plan to assess, you know, is this a good plan or not? An easy test is, does it drive down carbon pollution? Right, because we're working with climate plan. We all know we have targets that drive it down. We all know carbon pollution is going up around the world to deal with this problem has got to come down. So if it's not going down, then it's probably not a good plan. And when you look at this, there were 18 different actions in the plan. 
that yellow line, the dotted yellow line, that's if everything in the plan got acted in as written, right? So everything the government, provincial government said they were going to do gets done on the timeline they presented. Okay, so it's quite a generous assessment because it's assuming everything gets done. Now when you look at this, what you see is that you know, by 2030 emissions are actually higher than today. So this plan is saying you know, over the next 14 years emissions are going to go up by a little bit. They're actually going to go up and then come down a bit, but they're still going to be higher than today. And even out to 2050, we're way off from BC's provincial target. So when we put you know, BC's climate plan fizzles, that was you know, part of that reaction. Now there's another test I like to do because not everything in plans happens, right? There's lots of different commitments in there. There's strategies, there's um, promises to spend money that hasn't been approved yet. So I do another test. And then one of those tests is, you know, is it a regulation? So is it something that, uh, that requires a certain behavior change, like a building code? You know, new buildings should be built to a certain level of energy efficiency. We know that these type of regulations are quite effective at driving down carbon pollution. So that's one test. Another one is, is the carbon tax going up? Are you putting a price on carbon pollution than higher than was there? Okay, so we know that carbon taxes, cap and trade, things that put a price on it, um, are also quite effective at driving down carbon pollution. We also want a date. Is there a date in there? I mean, it's a plan. You don't really know when that policy is kicking in, if there's no date. And then we also want, um, if there's a price, we want to see, you know, has that been approved? Is it in a budget? You know, has, has the provincial government committed to, to spending this money? Things like incentives for electric vehicles. The plan also has commitments for transmission lines um, that will require a lot of funding, but that doesn't actually have approval in the plan. So if you put in that filter, you take those 18 actions, you put them through the filter, you end up with this, this purple line here. Because a lot of those fall out because they don't have one of those things, right? They don't, they don't pass that test. And that line says that emissions are going to keep on increasing under this plan. And so it's really not a, a, a good enough plan for British Columbia to reduce emissions. Now, who enjoys living in this province because it's seen as a, a climate leader? BC's been leading the charge on this for a number of years. Like, does that, do you like that, like being part of BC? And, so I, I moved here in part because of that. I love that reputation. I wanted to work on these issues. I wanted to be part of um, a province that was working in this direction with all the incentives, the regulations that make that happen. And what this also means is BC saying, we're done. We are not going to lead on this anymore. It's not us. It's not British Columbia. Because if you look at other plans, Ontario, Quebec, vetted by independent experts, they're going to hit their targets. So BC is passing the torch with this and saying, you know, we're, not, we're not doing that anymore. And there's actually a lot of benefits that come from leadership. So that's the downer. Now some positive uh, things. Um, so number one, so I, could, I can still be optimistic even knowing that this plan is not where I wanted it to be at. It's not where Clean Energy Canada wanted it to be at. It's not where I think a lot of people in British Columbia wanted it to be at. Because number one, I know we can hit our targets. We can reduce carbon pollution. The climate leadership team that Nancy was a part of, that my boss Marin Smith was a part of, that um, a number of people in the business community, First Nations, municipalities were a part of, presented a set of recommendations that gets us very close to our targets. We did our own piece of analysis, hiring some of the, you know, the best modelers in this field to, to take a look at that as well. So I know that we can get there as, as British Columbia. Um, we also know from those same studies that you know, it, it's good from an economic perspective as well. GDP continues to grow, job growth continues um, as, as you act on climate, and that's what this slide is up here. That's the outcome of this piece of re research. Um, over the next 10 years, you'd see about 270,000 jobs, 32,000 in the resource sector, as you put in the policies that would, would meet, our, that would meet our, our climate targets. And by the way, there's probably a lot of people in here that want all the details, the policy details. I got 10 minutes, so I can't go into all the pieces. There's this piece of work here, and the graph I showed you before. We've got a blog online that has all the, the breakdown of all the policies, and we've actually got a new piece of research we'll be releasing at the end of October. So if that's the kind of detail you want, you can look to those sources or you can ask me questions um, after the presentation. 
There's another piece that's equally important because not only do we know, you know, dealing with climate is the right thing to do, right? But it's also increasingly the right thing to do from an economic perspective. Uh, China earlier this year released what they think in the investment number is going to be for them to hit their climate targets, for them to, you know, all the renewable energy targets they have, electric vehicle targets, and that's $6.6 .6 trillion to invest in those things, windmills, solar panels, um, electric vehicles, and all the equipment that makes that stuff work together. And BC is in a very good position to export to that market or to import some of the technologies produced there. And to make this real, there's two different companies that, uh, uh, two stories that have come up recently. One is a company named Britco. Who's ever heard of Britco? Oh, good. That's more than I was expecting. So Britco, they just uh, installed a passive house in Bella Bella, um, about an 80% savings in greenhouse gas emissions, 80% less energy use, and also near 80% reduction in costs. And it was actually cheaper to build than the regular home. Now that building, it's a beautiful building, you can go look it up online. You can heat the whole thing in the coldest day up there with six 100 watt light bulbs. Everyone's using LEDs, but anyways, for the comparison. Um, and that, that company is now exporting to Indonesia and, and Russia, right? So that building, learning how to build things that way, comes about from domestic policies and pushing the envelope here, but then it allows you to compete in these other markets that are really growing. So that's a good business case. It means more jobs in BC. Ballard, the fuel cell guys, anyone know they signed a $200 million deal with China just a few months ago? With China, with a company in China called Synergy. This is to build a fuel cell production facility there that would then power the buses that, to reduce pollution in downtown cities across China. That's a great story. These things come about because of um, these uh, putting policies in place in BC and then also supporting the industries that can, can export to these countries. Overall, clean tech industry is now about 68,000 jobs across British Columbia. It's grown by 12% over the past four years. So this, is, this is now a growth area as well. And if you lead on climate, you get to do better in this sector. So what's next? The number one thing, I think, there's BC Climate Plan. I didn't like the plan in total. There are a few good things in there, and we'd like to see those implemented. So the next step for BC is to take what's in there and get those in place. And you'll see that in the next budget, hopefully. So that'll be kind of early next year. Uh, but the, really, I'm keeping my eyes on what's happening at the federal government. Um, we're going to have, there's the climate talks coming up, uh, and then there's also these working groups that have been trying to figure out what Canada does as a whole. And that type of information is going to start coming out, out over the next couple of months. And we've already seen a good taste of that in the, the carbon tax, uh, sorry, the carbon pricing announcement um, that came out just yesterday. Um, and then, oh, there's also in there you have the carbon tax. There's probably also going to be more details on funding. The last federal budget had a lot of money for infrastructure, green infrastructure and that kind of thing that we don't know the details on. So that's another piece to look for. Um, and even when we do those, so BC implements what they said they're going to do, we get more information from the federal government, there's still going to be a big gap on what British Columbia is going to do, so there's going to have to be some in, uh, update to the plan that, that was released earlier this year. So those are the three things to watch, and I think I'm at my 10 minutes now, so I'll pass it on. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. You always have, you know, prettier slides than I do. And there's, there's the, the, so you didn't even get to the publicity I part. Know. I know. So that's, you could Tweet have left. Tweet it out. <laughs> yeah, leave that on for a few seconds. So uh, I'm going to carry on from where um, Jeremy sort of left us, but I want to start with a bigger question at the beginning. What is our policy goal? Is it just BC? Well, clearly no. Greenhouse gases are ubiquitous, they're worldwide. Is it just Canada? Well, clearly no. It's got to be the whole, the whole globe. But we start with what we can control. And what we can control within our policy realm, within our own actions, is of course our local goals. So I just want to remind people of the goals here. We, and Jeremy showed you the, the, the graph of it, we targeted a 33% reduction below 2007 and 80% by 2050. 2020, we're not going to make. Nobody, there's no way we can make it. The climate leadership team proposed that we would have a 2030 goal. The government of British Columbia did not do it. Interestingly, the federal government has introduced a 2030 goal, so we'll come back to that. 
But I think we want to think about how do we best meet this goal. I'm an economist and I want to meet these goals, but I want to do it in a way that is the lowest cost possible so that we have the fewest trade-offs in meeting that goal. So when we think about policies, we want to think about ones that achieve the target with the least cost available. So we give those people and industries the opportunity to meet it in a way that best reduces their costs of meeting the goal. So I want to come back to that in the, in the form of the policies. For example, one way we could meet a goal federally very quickly would be to shut down every coal-fired power plant in the country by next year. Ontario shut its coal-fired power plants several years ago. That was one of the single most important things that happened in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So those sort of policies are one we should think about in the context of everything that's going on. Down. Down. <laughs> down. There we go. It doesn't do the page down. So Jeremy already talked to you about the climate, uh, the climate plan. As, as he said, I was a member of the climate leadership team. If you want to meet a really good report, if you can promote clean energy, I can promote the climate leadership team's report. It's a pretty good report. We felt really good about it because we came very, very close to meeting the 2050 target. We proposed a 2030 target. We had 32 recommendations led by uh, a carbon price. And I'll talk about why I think carbon prices are so important as a stimulus to getting to the most cost-effective means of reaching our, whatever our targets are. Um, that these were broadly based across all the sectors. As Jeremy said, the provincial government picked some of those recommendations, actually very few of them, but they do not meet the target and they did not propose any change in the price of carbon. Their argument at the time was we have to wait and see what happens. Now we've got a, for, uh, a, you know, a, the, the initial plan for what's going to happen. So I'm going to end, just in case you don't make it to the end, by saying how are we going to respond now to what the federal government has announced. As Jeremy suggested, the uh, federal government, in terms of its announcements last week, or the week before, was to announce approval subject to a number of conditions for the Pacific North Northwest LNG plant. That's the one up in uh, Prince Rupert. They also introduced an emissions cap, which said that you must not emit more than that amount. What I'd like to talk about now is just to focus on that for a few minutes, on, on LNG and natural gas. Because one of the things, and Jeremy, no offense to your forecast, that assumes it's going ahead. And as an economist, I look at both the supply of natural gas and the demand for natural gas in the LNG form to, to liquefy it, to get it to market. And I got to tell you folks, I think it's highly unlikely that that plant will be built anytime soon. I'm not the only one. This is information from the International Energy Agency, who spends thousands of people working on energy forecasts. And I'm not going to go through each of these points, simply to say the first two say that the supply is very, very ample. There's already plants in existence, already plants exporting. The U.S. brought on a plant in Louisiana, Sabine, and it's, it's down for maintenance now but it has up to seven trains, which is a, you know, a very large amount of capacity. That plant is operating, it is shipping, sent its first shipment over to Asia. Yes, it has to go farther, but it can ship at a lower cost. There's other capacity already installed. You can see the numbers up there. This does not count any Canadian capacity. Demand, on the other hand, is not growing as we forecast, as folks forecast even a few years ago. China's LNG demand is now forecast to grow only at 1.1%. Several years ago, it was what, Jeremy, 6, 7, 8% a year. They are also developing their own natural gas supplies. So if we've got ample supply coming on stream before any Canadian manufacturer gets up there, and we have demand that's much lower for all kinds of good reasons, as substitution, bringing in renewable sources, economic growth is not as high as they forecast, who is going to make money building this plant? To reinforce that, here's a picture of why folks were so optimistic and why I think they should be pessimistic now. The graph is the price of LNG exported to Japan. You can see it has a lovely upward slope up until close to uh, midpoint around 2015. 
And that was what people were looking at a few years ago, saying, okay, there's going to be a market for this, the price is going up, we'll get our gas to market. Those little orange dots, which are funny shapes, that's the price in December 2015, and the price, the most recent one I could get, August 2016. The August 2016 price is $6 and 30 odd cents, uh, well below the peaks that we saw a few years ago. I am not privy to what it costs to bring this gas to market for British Columbia, but what I've seen in industry reports is we need a price between nine and $11 per thousand cubic feet to be able to make it viable. The price is six, it's half that amount. Now, things could change. Anything could change. There could be exogenous events. So, I mean, is this good news or bad news? Depends on what side you're on. But it means that, you know, there is a lot of uncertainty in what's going to happen in the future. This plant is one that, you know, at least the experts in the field think that there is a very strong chance it's not going to happen. So if LNG doesn't happen, then we, you know, the question is, can BC go back and say, well, we've got one of these sectors we were trying to promote. What's stopping us from raising the carbon tax now? You know, if that was going to injure an industry that we wanted to promote, and I'm telling you from the industry data that I can get, this is an industry that may not exist, does it take away the argument or one of the arguments not to raise the carbon tax? Something to think about. This one just says the forecast, and again, this is a forecast that was made a couple of years ago, the, the little red dots up there are more demand than supply. The little green dots are more supply than demand. We've now, we're now in 2016. They were still forecasting a shortage a few years ago. That's gone. So even a few years ago, there was a forecast that there would not be sufficient demand to absorb potential supply. And that seems to be coming about. Okay. Moving to the feds, we can't not talk about the federal government and I'm sure there'll be questions about it. This is my understanding of what the Prime Minister announced yesterday. And again, I wanna bring it back to what does that mean for British Columbia? So they are announcing a floor price, $10 a ton for carbon that will rise over time at $10 a ton up to 2022, at which point they take stock again. Provinces can decide how they're going to meet it either with like ours, a carbon tax, or like uh, Alberta, or, or Alberta has a tax, like Ontario and Quebec, a market trading system. And these are some of the requirements. They must start and rise up. They also say that one of the crucial things, and I'm gonna end with a slide that asks questions, how do we compare policies across the country? This is a conversation that's going to be happening daily from now on with the federal announcement. How do we compare the equivalency of policies across the country. Does closing a coal-fired power plant, which I argued a few minutes ago would be a very good thing to meeting greenhouse gas targets, is that somehow equivalent? The uh, Premier of Nova Scotia would like that to be equivalent. How do we incorporate that? Would Brad Wall be a little bit less grouchy if, if he got credit for closing a coal-fired coal power plant, if he indeed would do that? So those are some of the questions that you're gonna see and we're going to be asking. The crucial bullet is the one that's second from the bottom, that every province is going to have to show how it is going to help meet the federal target. Now we can discuss whether the federal target is too lame and too small or not, but every province is going to have to do that. So one of the challenges for British Columbia, as Jeremy pointed out with his slide, is we're not meeting the target. How are we going to contribute to the federal target? That's something that we would all like to see going forward. So, issues. Equivalency, I've already talked about that. How do we compare what each province is doing? Every province has a basket now of climate policies, even the ones that are moving the most slowly. As an economist, I also worry about, is this gonna to lead to a whole bunch of different prices which may induce some organizations, some companies to move from one province to another to get a better deal. This is gonna be a, another topic that you're gonna see and it's gonna get technical and it's gonna get a bit messy, but it's something we wanna ask. Are there ways for companies to stay in British Columbia, meet our policy regime without it being more favorable to move to Ontario because they have a better deal for them? So 
all provinces are going to be challenged going forward to answer these questions. Ideally, we want a uniform policy stance in terms of equivalency across the country. We do not want to create any incentives for companies to move to another part of Canada to, in response to a climate policy in their own province. So this is something that we're going to have to look at. And one of the things you're going to see going forward is are they going to allow offset trading? An offset is investing in something that reduces carbon emissions, and that allows you to continue to emit the emissions. In British Columbia, we have no offsets for the carbon tax. You pay the tax on every ton of, GH, of CO2e that you emit. Will we allow anything like that? Allowing it would give us more flexibility, but it'll have impact on the revenues that British Columbia more than recycles to uh, citizens and to companies in this province. You're already seeing the political fallout. That's not my expertise. I figure if you've got people opposed to you on both sides, you're kind of not so bad. Um, but we're not going to hit the 2030 target, or we probably won't hit the 2030 target. So what are we going to do? Is that, is that $10 starting soon enough? Modeling that we have did for the climate leadership team suggested that while it'll be more expensive if we delay raising the price till about 2020, am I, I'm a little, high. little high? You can't hear me? Darn. They can hear me. Uh, if we don't raise the price till 2022, 23, it'll delay it. But if we then jump it up by $10 a year and keep jumping it up, our modeling for the CLT said that we will again get very close. So on one hand, I'm really optimistic. If we can stay the path, I would be even more delighted if the Prime Minister had said not that in 2022 we're going to sit there and say, hmm, is that good enough? We know it's not good enough. I would have been happier if he said we're going to keep that price going up at $10 a ton year after year after year till we get the stimulus and the change that we need to read our targets. So I leave you with the question, and maybe you will have the answer. What will BC do? What should BC do to revise their plan? Because the Premier has said, we will revise the plan in light of the federal announcements. So let's stay tuned. Thanks. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much, Nancy and Jeremy. We'll now go to you to, for comments and questions. Could people just quickly pick up their hands, those people who'd like to lead off? I saw you can just get a sense in the room. No one is interested. Oh, very good. Uh, gentleman in the yellow jacket and Angela here will pass microphones. It's a little hard to get around the room, so please help us get the mics around. And if you could keep comments or questions you know, fairly succinct, that way we can get more people in. Great. So you guys have convinced me, not that I wasn't convinced walking into the door. Uh, what I, my question is, is what is the logic that's driving the Premier's decision making around this? So you're making a strong case. What would her rebuttal be? And if you'll, excuse me, I forgot to say, I, I invite people just to give us your name and if you'd like an institutional affiliation. Right. Uh, James Casey, WWF Canada. Okay. You, you want to start that one? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll give some of the rebuttals and then rebuttals to some of the rebuttals. Um, one of the... Uh, I think when I look at a lot of the polling across British Columbia, um, right into the mic. How about this? Is that better? Okay. When you look at the views across British Columbia right now, there's been some recent polling, right? Um, half the people across British Columbia don't even know we have a climate plan. I bet you all know what the number one issue is right now. Who's worried about affordability and housing, right? So. I think that's one of the key things, right? It's not tracking up at the, the top of the list. Um, and so an election's coming up. You know, you tend to want to get reelected. So I think that's, that's one, of the, the, the key, uh, one of the key pieces. Um, another comment is also, you know, BC has had a carbon tax. It's, you know, still the highest in place in Canada right now. And some of the other policies you want to see, like a low carbon fuel standard, um, uh, like a clean electricity requirement are in place. And so BC is saying, look, you know, we've taken the lead on that. Um, it's time for others to catch up. I can rebut that one later, but I think those are, are some of the two main ones. And then with LNG being a priority, that really taints which policies you're going to 
uh, going to support because you're, you're, you're considering the economics of that industry. Um, but as we've just heard from Nancy, there are more considerations than domestic carbon policy when thinking about LNG. I will weigh in on that middle one because I think there's a good case to continue leadership um, in British Columbia um, because one, I mean, the international reputation you get from this is, is quite important. BC has received a lot of praise over the last eight, eight years for what it's done and it's more than just praise. That brings some of the best thinkers on clean energy, clean technology, and for the clean tech sector, you want these leading thinkers there. We've also kept our electricity grid clean while the world is reducing emissions. That means any industry that runs on electricity has a competitive advantage against other jurisdictions. There are risks to being out in front, there are competitiveness issues, but those you can mitigate with smart policy design, which is done around the world with anyone that has carbon pricing. And I'll stop on that. Actually, I'll ask a question while people are thinking of questions or comments, and that is um, to either of you, in the Climate Leadership Plan, are there any measures that, to your analyses, represented a significant uh, improvement, point of departure, you know, a uh, step change up in terms of what existed before and related? Are there any measures that have been announced which are scalable should the provincial government wish to, uh, relatively easily scalable, to start uh, having a... a a deeper impact as per the federal announcements and, in fact, the, the existing legislative targets. Well, they can raise the carbon tax. <laughs> I mean, that's the easiest thing to scale up. And Jeremy's better place to go through the analysis of, of individual sectors. And is he, why am I talking for you? But, I mean, he, he just, you know, he showed that some of them are, are measures that are a little bit or difficult to quantify. So I would say, you know, there were 32 recommendations in the climate leadership team's report. What's stopping introducing all of them? Yeah, and when you look at those recommendations, we know, yeah, they're all scalable, exactly. So a lot of the dials you need to to drive down carbon pollution, we already have them. It's, it's about turning them up, and it's about um, dealing with some, there are you know, some real issues, you don't, it's not that simple, you don't just turn them all up, but um, I think a lot of the actual policies we need are either in place in British Columbia, so carbon pricing, low carbon fuel standard, uh, there's incentives for electric vehicles, those types of things, um, but it's about making them, them stronger over time, and starting to link them out as well uh, with other jurisdictions like you know, you can do stuff with Oregon, California, uh, and Washington. You can also do stuff across Canada. Yes, thank you very much. My name is uh, Ramona Materi. I'm here as an individual citizen. Uh, my question, if I, I guess, Jeremy, if you could expand. You had a slide that said these 270,000 jobs and so forth. But more specifically, because I think, and here's my comment, I think for a lot of people who don't follow climate stuff, climate carbon pricing is the, the tax on the gas, and that's it, and it goes up and down, the price of gas goes up and down, et cetera. But what is the government doing to, uh, in policy or regulation, to strengthen the jobs that would arise from renewable energy, that type of thing. Because I think, again, a comment, I think if you want to get support there, if people can see more clearly, the LNG industry has made a good pitch on, here's all these well-paying jobs that would come from LNG. Has the renewable energy sector made that same pitch, and is the government helping them to do that? Um, so it's a good, an excellent point, right? Because I think that, I think most people agree we got to do something with this problem. But it's hard if it's a trade-off for you personally from, a, from an employment perspective or if you just don't think generally the economy will do well if you deal with that. Um, so your question was on what's already happening in, in British Columbia. Um, so there's a few things. I mean, on the, the renewable energy side, we put in, British Columbia put in a, uh, a clean electricity standard saying, you know, essentially, our electricity that comes online, thou shalt make sure it's 93% clean, okay? So from renewable sources, it could also be carbon capture and storage. Now what that means is that instead of building natural gas plants, coal plants, British Columbia built run of river, run, uh, wind facilities, um, some biomass facilities, so you know, burning waste wood for energy. A lot of those projects are typically 
you know, outside the lower mainland. So they're distributed across the province. They end up being long-term jobs because they have 25-year you know, power purchase agreements. So those facilities are going to be operating for that length of time, and also with a lot of First Nation communities. So I think that's one of the key stories. And you know, Clean Energy BC, who's Clean Energy Canada, Clean Energy BC, we're not actually affiliated, even though the names are very similar, um, does a good job at promoting that case. But when you look right now, there actually isn't a lot of growth in that sector. What a climate plan would do is it requires more clean electricity because you're switching off of fossil fuels. So that's where the, one of the barriers is right now. But that's where you'd see a lot of job growth is in the, um, in the renewable energy sector. Um, and then the other s numbers I mentioned on the clean technology industry. Um, so I, I, I mentioned a number of 68,000 jobs in the clean tech sector. Is that something people have been hearing quite a bit? I mean, it, you get some of it, but a lot of the focus in BC has been on the resource sector, an important sector in BC, but these other sectors are growing quite quickly. So I think some of it is about telling the successes of what has already happened and how you expect those sectors to grow if you support them further. I'll end it on that piece. Okay, uh, actually we'll just slightly change the sequence by availability of the mic, so there. And then I'll come back to you, but I'm going to go with Bill Harper next. Alex Boston, I work with cities, provinces on climate stuff. Um, I'm philosophically, I'm super supportive of carbon taxes, and I think that's the direction we inevitably have to go in. My big concern is governments die on on taxes on a long-term basis. GST, HST, it's, it's a real tragedy, and twinning the climate agenda with taxes is not very appealing. And I think you said it, Jeremy, like in this province, affordability really matters. And you know, we have to start looking at hitching the climate wagon to priorities that are really shaking people up. So you know, in this region, it's congestion and you know, it's driving times and it's affordability. In this province right now, we have it, more than 20% of 80-year-olds live in single detached homes. Um, soon, there'll be more single-person households than any other type of household in Canada by 2025. And a lot of those people are going to be in single detached homes. There's a massive opportunity to move away from 5-10% improvements in, in residential building performance to actually double per capita GHGs by increasing household occupancy. It's, it's like um, stratifying and establishing secondary suites. In, in Metro Vancouver, in the city of Vancouver, 40% of single detached homes have secondary suites, but literally there's, there's jurisdictions where there's literally three or four or five percent. If the provincial government established an incentive, used the, that, the millions of dollars that are coming in to allow people to make you know, fire and safety upgrades, um, to establish secondary suites would be a huge opportunity to twin that carbon management agenda. So I'm, a question for Nancy is really what level do we have to get for people to really change behaviors around uh, making decisions? Because it, you know, really it's very modest in, in British Columbia right now. And I, 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 I wonder if we have the, the, uh, if the, if the taxpayer has the tolerance to go as high as we really need to make some behavioral changes. And then both of you, you know, where do you think the biggest opportunities are for twinning that agenda? You know, you know, climate change, the deep emission reductions come the co-benefit of these bigger, bigger socioeconomic and environmental agendas. Thanks, Alex. You've, you've, your speech was, as always, excellent on, <laughs> on, on the issues. Uh, a couple of points. One is good climate policy accommodates those folks who are the most adversely affected by it. The, the, the brilliance of the initial BC carbon plan was the revenue neutrality, which reduced corporate and personal income taxes and provided uh, you know, compensation or offsets to folks in rural areas and uh, people on low incomes. Good climate policy, good tax design continues that. So as the tax rate goes up, you want to ensure that those people who are least able to afford it, so the affordability index is taken into account, and that adjusts as well. 
So I think that was what's, uh, you know, commensurate on governments to ensure that they do those sorts of things. If you look now at some of the things that are being attributed to the carbon tax, I encourage you to all go read the provincial budget, as I'm sure you all do when you go home at night. Um, but the page that's really interesting is what happens to the carbon tax. And uh, right now we pay back more than we receive. Uh, so point number one, good policy design is, is very important, important. The second thing you asked is what price do we need? All I'll say is that in our initial carbon price increases in BC, we did see a decline in emissions. Now, some people may argue that also coincided with that little global financial crisis, but good analysis showed that there was an increment that is due to the carbon tax. In other words, people did change their behavior. How do we know this? Ridership on transit went up, people not replacing cars or uh, getting rid of cars. I mean, there, there were a bunch of little indicators that show it. In countries where they've had a price on carbon that is more substantial, there is clear evidence that it changes behavior. What happens, though, when it doesn't go up is you lose that forecasting. So you're a company, and you're trying to decide how to invest, reinvest in something. You're trying to figure out how to, what, a, what kind of boiler you're going to put in. Do I fire that with gas, or do I have some new whiz-bang, high-tech, renewable energy thing? If you know that carbon price is going to go up, and it's going to cost you a lot more to use gas or oil, you're going to make that substitution now. So what I would argue is it's the freezing of the carbon price that reduces the incentives. If companies are seeing that price go up, they're going to make investments, and having it go up over time is what's important so people have time to make those changes. You know, if you're thinking of replacing your vehicle and you know that price is going up, that it's not going to go up and down and up and down with the petrol prices, then you're going to start looking at an EV, an electric vehicle, or you're going to get buy that bus pass. So yes, it does change behavior, but that price has to continue to go up. It has to continue to go up along with all the other policies. So that's why the, the CLT report, Climate Leadership Team report, had all these other policies in there. It's not just the price. It's everything else. So it's marrying it with good urban design. But, you know, we need our leaders at all levels of, 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 of leadership from municipal on up to see this as an integrated package. And Deb's going to ask us about adaptation. We should be making investments now because it's already too late, people, you know. The, 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 the water's coming and it's getting higher. And so we should be combining our mitigation with our adaptation policies and making those kind of investments. But Alex, it takes leadership at all levels. And a leader is not afraid to go out and raise a tax. We did it in British Columbia and, and got a little messed up on the HST. But before that, you know, that kind of leadership uh, was, was supported, as Jeremy said, by the voters. Okay. Um, hi, Deb Harford with uh, SFU Adaptation to Climate Change Team and Climate Solutions Fellow at the Center for Dialogue with uh, Michael and Marin Smith. Um, yeah, I'm kind of asking about adaptation. Nan <laughs> Nancy knows. Nancy's also part of my organization. But um, actually, I was asking one of my my question was partly around sources of emissions and um, one. Study I've seen says that a third of our global emissions are due to soil and ecosystem degradation. Um, I don't know if that's the case in BC. I, I wanted to ask you guys if that is the case. Um, and if, if that is the case, it seems to me it would be harder to tax that. Um, how do you incent foresters and farmers and other landowners to maintain uh, their soil and their ecosystems intact? Um, could that be related to offsets? Um, it certainly is related to climate change adaptation because healthy soil and ecosystems absorb floodwaters, provide cooling, help species survive. So there, there's a really good integration there, but um, I just wondered how that soil carbon and, and ecosystem degradation piece fits in with some of your thinking. So I don't know the portion in, in, in BC emissions from that source. It is in the uh, in the BC inventory, um, but I'm just uh, I'm not remembering the numbers. Six percent. There you go. Um, 
on how to do that. So no, that hasn't been in our in our pieces of, of work because we focus a lot on, on the energy side of things. Um, but the types of mechanisms you've mentioned are the types of options. I mean, it could be, yeah, you develop protocols around it um, and then incorporate them as credits in a, in a trading system or something like that. So those are ways that that can be incorporated. There's lots of, you have to be very careful with it because, you know, you have to determine, well, what would have happened otherwise? Um, to that source, and that's always hard because you're talking about the future, so it has to be very carefully designed, but that type of thing. But maybe Nancy has more to, to say on that. Well, that's what I was talking about a few minutes ago, too. It's integrated planning. I mean, it's, it's looking at the whole ecosystem as a whole, not in little itty-bitty parts of it that we can carve off and, you know, protect a bear here and, and do something there. So how do we do it? We have clear protected areas. We don't uh, destroy the agricultural land reserve by carving it up into little hobby farms that don't actually do farming and agriculture. We have best management practices on our ag lands so that they too are conserving carbon and we find a way to compensate them for the value they do, which would be your, your offsets. Sometimes offsets get a bad name because they are not as rigorously defined and enforced, but a good offset system will provide the funding to provide the incentive for people to do the right thing, and then some regulations like manure management and other sorts of things and non-degradation policies would all help. So I come back to the theme that we can't act in silos here. We have to put the pieces together and say, how do we get an integrated whole? And it get us away from this thing that makes me crazy about jobs versus the environment. I mean, you know, I will on my tombstone say, she said, it's jobs and the environment. <laughs> you know, so let's stop thinking about that as a trade-off. Jeremy's got hundreds of jobs that he can create. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe thousands. I'm quite a businessman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, if people would just get the right policy regimes. Hi, my name's John Tack. I'm a sustainability consultant here in Vancouver. And Nancy, referring to your point about it's not jobs versus the economy, it, it's both together. It's absolutely right. Uh, one of the biggest advances in sustainability in business is the, um, the favorable knowledge that it directly impacts your bottom line. And I, I wrote the sustainability plan for Canada's largest manufacturer of natural health supplements, and it all went down to metrics and how it relates to the bottom line um, as, as well as, of course, the people equation, re uh, retaining talent and attracting new talent. So I'm, I'm curious as to um, how you, you guys cooperate with the business faculty in, at SFU. Is, is this something that is being taught? Because at, at the company where I did the sustainability plant right now, sustainability now is a fourth criteria in every decision that any employee makes. So it's built into the, into the employee description of every employee and it's going to be one part of their performance evaluation at the end of the year. And it, and it has a tremendous positive impact. It, it, it just, it's crazy that it's not uh, more widely spread and more, uh, being more adopted more quickly. Mm -hmm. I'll take that one. Yeah, it's taught at uh, SFU's business school. They have its uh, course in both the MBA program and undergraduate programs. There are several faculty members there that are you know, work with individual businesses too and have projects. They involve the students in the projects to do it. So it's growing, you know, it's like such a no-brainer that I totally agree with you. Why, why isn't there more of it and why isn't it happening? But when it does happen, people get it and they get it right away. So I, I you know, I am an optimist on that. I think it's something that we, you know, the proof is in the outcome. Why else would companies like, oh, little companies like Walmart, you know, be looking at a whole new supply chain, you know, in terms of sustainability, in terms of monitoring their GHGs, in terms of a whole host of things? Now, you may not like Walmart, but at least they're... Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, but it 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 is good business. Uh, we're getting we about ten minutes left, so we'll go to this gentleman here, and then you here, and then you, and I think that will probably wrap us up. Did you, did you still wish to make a comment? Yeah, sure. Please. Hi, I'm Jeff Timbeke, formerly of the Tai, and I'm now writing a 
climate book for Bloomsbury called Are We Screwed? Um, <laughs> and? <laughs> um, you'll have to read the book oh. to find out. <laughs> My question is, um, around the same time that BC's climate plan came out and um, fizzled, as you say, California released a plan that was incredibly ambitious. And given that BC and California's climate policies have kind of developed in tandem, um, do you have any sense of why California was able to you know, move forward with its leadership while BC stepped back? Short answer, not privy to that kind of, uh, uh, you know, behind the scenes. I don't know. I mean, the voters in California clearly supported it or will support it. Uh, the voters in BC, as Jeremy said, support climate action. So can't answer that question. I'll have one I mean, one, one piece, it's tough to pull this out specifically for that policy package, but in California, you've got the California Air Resources Board. And one of the um, um, points that's often made in California, why they've been able to push so hard, is they have this organization that's kind of arm's length from government, and it's given the ability to implement the policies necessary to meet climate targets so that you have a bit more consistency over governments. And we don't have that in, in, in British Columbia. Um, so that could be one contributor. And I just thought the other thing is they have fewer industrial sectors that they need to protect. So they perceive a smaller trade-off than is perceived here. Part of my argument is that I don't think the trade-off is as big as perceived because I think the market conditions are such that that trade-off is going to be lessened over time. The natural gas sector is challenged independent of climate policy. So the argument that you cannot go ahead because of the gas sector and protecting all those jobs, I think is much less compelling than it was several years ago. In California. Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. 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 And then they sue everybody, though. So, I mean, there's that problem. Yeah. Drought. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I'll take this as an indication we should do a carbon talk on California policies. And, <laughs> and uh, seriously, we in, in renewable cities, we talk with a lot of different groups in California. So thank you for that. And we'll go. I'll take, just take the last two questions and comments to make sure we can fit them in from you, sir, and then to this lady. My name is Nelson Lee. I, I work in the carbon market for a company called Green Sky. And in BC, you mentioned one of the silos. BC, for the last 10, uh, 60 years rather, since 2010, all the large emitters, about 80 or 90 of them, have had to report and verify their greenhouse gas emissions. But unlike Alberta and Ontario, Quebec, Manitoba will be in this, they haven't been asked to reduce their emissions at all. And I'm wondering, like, was that in the climate leadership team plan? And why not? Like, I mean, that's about 12% of our emissions. It seems like they know it. They could just say, yeah, 10 percent, 20, whatever the number is, right? Why not? So we don't have a cap on, on sectors. And in Ontario, Quebec, uh, California that have a cap in trade, they don't have a cap per sector. They have an overall cap. So they give you allowances that you can trade. But you can buy more on the market. So we, we don't do that. We, it, that's the sort of difference between a, a cap and trade system and a tax. In a tax system, by continuing to raise the price, you make it uneconomic for them not to reduce their emissions. No smart company is going to sit there and say, well, I could reduce my emissions at, at $20 a ton, but I won't reduce them. I'm going to pay $30 a ton. I mean, you won't stay in business if that's the way you think. So by, by making the recommendation to have that price go up, more and more companies would have to say, no, 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 it's in my interest to do it. So each of them have their sort of benefits, each type of policy regime. Both of them can work if they're well designed. But well, we have a carbon neutral government, only 1% of our income. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, my argument is if we raise the price, we would get those same kind of results. Plus, we have other regulations in place. Part of the what the government, we didn't talk about it, we were out of time. There are new regular, or there are intended regulations coming in for things like methane, which is a non, which is a big 
potential emitter if we're extracting gas. So it's a combination of regulations and pricing here. In Ontario and Quebec, it's a combination of regulations and, and trading. But each of them have, have, have good points and, and some challenging points. The shipping industry accounts for several percent of global emissions and is projected to rise substantially from yeah. there and is one of the few sectors that was left out of the Paris Agreement. And I was wondering whether you knew of any measures that have proposed um, BC or Vancouver to take that into account. For example, I've, I, I know it's difficult to, to allocate emissions from shipping because they're often um, headquartered here and, and exactly the international nature of it. I heard though that I think the European Union is requiring maybe ships start in the next year or two starting to uh, measure and report on their emissions as a first step to reining that in. Is there anything that, I don't know, Vancouver ports could do or some, some measures? Could your name? Fiona Koza. That's fine. Sure. Um, there's different pieces. I mean, one is when the ships are in port. I mean, the, the port right now is, uh, I forget the numbers, but they've got an electrification kind of set up so you plug in instead of burning your, um, burning your generator, um, running your generator while you're in port. That's good for climate, also good for air quality because I actually live kind of close to the port, so I'm happy uh, to hear that one. Um, also, cleaner burn, burning fuels um, is another option that could either be uh, we have a low carbon fuel standard which can incorporate you know, biofuels into that mix which would reduce emissions. Um, there actually is a role for natural gas there as well on, on, um, for some of the larger, uh, larger ships, so that's another way to go. Um, those, those are the ones that I know. Do you have more? Yeah, no, those are, the, I mean, the electrification and certainly the cruise ships have to plug in now. There's a conference going on in Rotterdam as we speak. International Conference on Ports, and I would look at what they're, I, I, I can't believe they are not talking about this issue. And I mean, it's way beyond my knowledge base, but I've seen some work looking at alternative, as Jeremy said, alternative fuels for this, for this sector. Um, and, uh, you know, cleaner burning fuels. But again, if we raise the price of those fuels, they're going to have incentives to look for other alternatives. Um, there's even, we didn't even talk about airplanes. You know, there's an airplane now, they've got a test plane that's running on, I don't know, hot air or something else. Electricity, <laughs> Electricity yeah. Certainly, I know that the technological and operational measures are just something more of a political issue. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the issue. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, they, you're right. The, complex, the complexity is where the ship is being accounted for. And if they're not accounted for here and they're burning here, it's still going up into the atmosphere. So that's where sort of global agreements would be useful. I found when I was at the COP21 last year, there were quite a number of, of, of parallel conferences, specifically both about the shipping and the aviation industries. So it's not a, far from a problem that's you know being ignored. It, it requires rather special kinds of protocols, both industry and internationally, in order to capture them because of the transnational nature of the business. We're come to the end of the hour. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my job just to, first of all, say again, uh, thank our sponsors, the North Growth Foundation and the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions. Thank all of you for coming.